and welcome to the show. And if you're watching this on a screen, well, you've certainly come to the right place. Today, we are talking screen time and how they're affecting our kids mentally, physically, emotionally. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. Now, it is a given fact that our kids are using screens more than ever, and they're spending at least a third of their day staring at screens. From online schooling to socialising and entertainment, both parents and teachers are concerned that, well, too much screen time is linked with depression, anxiety, poor sleep quality and a lack of physical activity. Well, in this special on screen time, we'll ask experts if there is a direct link between increased time online and poor behaviour, or are we being too cautious about children and screens? First up, this is what parents need to know about the good and bad when it comes to their kids and screen time. In the Brady Bunch days of decades ago, families huddled round a home movie. By the 80s and 90s, every house had a goggle box. Keep the change, you filthy animal. Then came the era of the mobile phone, and most teens had to have one. Sharpay and Ryan, cell phones, and I will see you in detention. Now screens fill our screens. Swipe, tap, click, squeeze. When you're playing, playing with the screen. Devices are used by kids of all ages every single day. I don't know. Never watch this thing. To entertain, socialise, connect and learn. In recent years, more than 50% of parents with young children thought they spent too much time online and a third were worried they would become addicted. For physical and mental health, government guidelines advise children under two should have no screen time. From two to five years old, it should be less than an hour a day, while under 17 should have less than two hours, not including their schoolwork. Oh, it's right! I'm right! The pandemic has only added to the amount of screen time, making recommended limits for many families impossible to keep, as remote learning, video calls and social media replaced the face-to-face. -face. Get ready for a trouncing. A Digital Australia report found that 76% of parents engaged with their kids through games during lockdown. 60% of kids used video games for schoolwork. Households with a gaming device also increased. In 2005, 76% of homes had at least one console, but by 2021 that rose to 92%. On average, each child now owns three devices, but more than 80% of parents felt they were a negative distraction. Our game-based learning platform is used by millions of people all over the world. Gamification has become a major part of education. Used to enhance student engagement, it can also allow teachers to better tailor lessons to the individual. But the Department of Education warns it should be balanced with other forms of teaching and the apps may only encourage extrinsic motivation. The Centre for Responsible Technology at the Australia Institute reported gambling in many popular video games can be widespread, pernicious and hidden allowing players to spend real money on virtual items, otherwise known as loot boxes. But regardless of the downsides, <laughs> screens are now omnipresent in our children's lives, and the virtual world is a major part of reality. Hello. So now we've got a picture of what's happening with kids and their screens and we wanted to know what the reality was at home. So we asked parents and children about how much of their day is spent swiping, clicking and watching. Well, I'm Carmen. Um, I'm Nick. And this is Julia. <laughs> and she's uh, four. I can work up to, you know, 15 hours a day. And lately that's been all on the computer, thanks to um, courtrooms not being open due to COVID. Um, and then most of my unwinding time is also done looking at screens. My whole life is on, in, in front of screens at the moment, which is not great. I find myself mindlessly looking at a screen um, once Juliet's gone to bed as well and, and being quite irritated that I've wasted my time doing that. I think that Juliet probably spends 
too much time on screens as well. It's been a little bit harder because of COVID, but I think she'd probably spend most of her time at home looking at a screen in one way or another. It's mostly on the TV in the house and um, it feels more interactive. Like it feels like she's still often kind of, um, it's on, but she'll be doing other activities. We find that if we put her in front of an iPad or a computer or a phone, she'll be really engrossed and to the point where sometimes she's almost a little bit aggressive when you try to take it off her. Um, whereas with the TV, you know, a show ends and she's like, okay, I'm going to go do something else now. I think that we're blessed with a child that has, uh, I don't know, is sociable and has an imagination. So I think that's why I don't have the concern that um, maybe other people will, even though I know that it's not good to be looking at a screen, the amount that we do. Now, the pandemic drove home the major role that technology now plays in education, more so now than ever before. COVID lockdowns forced lessons to move from the classroom to online for students of all ages. And that has now left us wondering if the pandemic has changed the way children learn forever. Well, Professor Parsi Salberg is an educator, a former teacher and author. He's also advised governments and institutions around the world. Parsi, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Parsi, I wonder, are schools incorporating more technology into their curriculum? I'm talking about ed tech, uh, software, online uh, programs, devices even. Are we seeing more of that in classrooms? Well, we are definitely, uh, we have seen more of that during the last two years around the world. And, and we, we should keep in mind that uh, educational technology was a big deal already before the pandemic uh, started. But, you know, one way to see this, uh, this whole pandemic, the, the last uh, almost two years, is a, a kind of a large uh, experiment around the world, how schools and, and children can adapt to the, the world of technology. And I think uh, s certainly uh, during the remote learning, there has been much more uh, engagement with the different digital devices at homes and I, I'm sure that it's going to continue in the schools when, when we are back to, uh, back to normal. I wonder though, you know, if you say that more schools are uh, incorporating online learning, uh, programs, software, edutech, digital devices in their curriculum, how does that compare with traditional teaching or learning? Is there a notable difference there? Absolutely. I, I think it really depends on how people understand teaching and particularly what we think about when we, we are looking at children's learning. Uh, most children now, if we ask them, they see learning as something that happens between people. It often happens between, between the teachers and themselves. It's a communication and, and listening and also feeling these emotions that are very important. Sometimes it's a, it's a learning between the, 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 uh, themselves and, and their peers. Mm. So, so I, I think that, you, you know, learning, when learning happens with the technology, technology which is a wonderful thing, it really opens uh, the world to our students and, and us as well. It's a, it's a different way of interaction than what children do when they are in the classroom working uh, working with their friends and working with the teacher. So uh, I, I think that we're also beginning to understand that the, the, there are two very different types of processes of learning. They both are good and both necessary and they have their place, but we should not probably think that one of them can replace the other. Well, that in itself is also interesting because if kids are using devices at school for their school work, but they're also using devices to keep in touch with friends, to play games on as well, that line between learning and leisure is really starting to blur, isn't it? So how do you tell where that line is? How do you teach a child to be able to demarcate for, them to, for themselves that, all right, I'm learning here, now it's my leisure time, but I'm still going to be on screens? And is, is that a negative impact? Yeah, it can be. And, and we have, um, um, I have been leading research here in, in the University of New South Wales, where we have been asking this particular thing that how much parents, for example, when they uh, hand over the digital devices, iPads or smartphones to their kids, that how much they expect them to do learning and, and how much uh, it's about entertainment. And according to our data, it's a, most, of the, most of the parents uh, really use and they see the, the gadgets as uh, entertainment. So, 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 but as you said, that you know, this line between learning and, and, and leisure is, uh, is a very difficult to draw. 
uh, we know that young people they use the technology in a very different ways. You know, some some young people use it to create things. They may write something or compose or draw or design, and then there are those who just use it for for consuming the the entertainment. So it's a it's a very difficult in this conversation to. Um, you, you know, use any any kind of a general patterns or rules in in this thing. It really depends on it depends on families, the parents, and it depends on the young people themselves. Yeah, it's all still early days. Pasi, it is great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wilson. I'm a lecturer at UTS, and this is Natalie. Yeah. And how old are you, Natalie? I'm 10 years old. And you are? Tristan. And you are? Six. Yes. Watch uh, streaming, online streaming movies and some YouTube videos. And um, pretty much I uh, use that for communication with my family members. Uh, I play Roblox all the time. And I like some cool things. But... I always play Wacky Wizards because they have a new update. <laughs> I watch YouTube on my iPad and I play Roblox on my iPad. Well, she wants to play more. We, we just don't allow her to. <laughs> yeah, so we don't allow her to play on the weekends hey. and we restrict their uh, screen time to about one hour, an hour and a half. Okay, and um, we, we try to mix it up with different activities so that they don't spend too much time on the screens. So we are now going to delve just that little bit deeper into the impact that technology and screens are having on our children. And joining me now is Professor of Psychiatry and Co-Director of Health and Policy at Sydney University's Brain and Mind Centre, Ian Hickey. We also have Principal of Independent Girls School, Winona, Dr. Bryony Scott, who specializes in the utilization of technology in the classroom, and also joining us, the Director of the Center for Responsible Technology, Peter Lewis. Thank you so much for all three of you joining us today on the show. Bryony, I want to start with you. You know, technology, listen, it's no doubt it is just um, taking over our kids' lives. They're on the iPads, they're on the laptops, they're on the computers for leisure, but also for learning as well. I wonder how much does digital technology, how much of that have you inculcated into your curriculum? A significant amount. I think it's important to clarify that technology, digital technologies of any form, have, are, are pervasive amongst children and adults. And so a large part of what we do at schools is um, imitate what is happening out in the world beyond schools. So what we're doing at the school level is a version of what is happening out in society more broadly. Mm. Uh, the rules are a little different because they're younger uh, and they're more vulnerable, but the reality is this is a huge social experiment that we're playing on the population at large. Uh, for which we have very few answers and a lot of questions. Yeah, it's a very interesting experiment that we're all living through at the moment. But, Bryony, I do wonder, you know, if you were to compare traditional teaching learning methods to yes. uh, teaching and learning methods now using digital technology, is there a marked comparison? Is it, it, are there any real differences? When I first started in the teaching profession, we had Ronio machines and uh, and you, you have gone through a range of, I can remember fax machines thinking they were the most wonderful thing ever. Overhead projectors changed my life. Um, and I look at it now and I think technology is in, always changing and how we adapt and use that in the classroom is also changing really quite significantly. And so therefore how you teach your pedagogical approach is different according to the device or the implement that you're using uh, to help students understand. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you know what Bryony said was very interesting in that she said it, it, we're living through this experiment uh, at the moment, but every generation had an experiment, didn't it? You know, if you throw back to our grandparents' time, I suppose it was rock and roll, maybe that was the experiment, and then we had the TVs, and apparently kids were watching too much TVs. I turned out all right, I think. Um, now we've got digital technology and they're the new babysitters. Are we being overly cautious about this? I don't think we can be overly cautious. I think we need to be really mindful 
of the changed environment our kids are consuming information. When I was a kid, information was scarce and the journey was to find information. Now it's ubiquitous and its quality is variable. And so the toolkit that um, teachers like Bryony need to, to equip our kids with is, is very, very different and very challenging. One of my concerns is that the um, blurring of space between education and the, the more, as what you call leisure, is actually also a much more commercial environment where they're exposed to a whole bunch of, of business models designed to um, harvest and sell their attention. So it's not just adapting to a new technology, it's also equipping our kids to be resilient to new business models as well. And this attention, attention data, that's the new currency, isn't it? And that's what big tech really sort of trades on, isn't it? Talk mm. to us about that. Talk to us yeah. about trying to rein in big right. tech when it comes to, you know, uh, trading our attention and, and, and our data. Is it, is it happening at all? We know from the um, testimony recently of Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen, the degree to which Instagram as a performative social media platform is having really negative impacts, particularly on teenage girls. Now, I really respect the way our teachers have adapted to technology, particularly through the lockdown, but it is also not... That is the environment which is kind of free of the business models, but then equipping our children to still be able to be resilient and survive in a world where, as I called it before, their attention is constantly for sale is really, really challenging. And it's just going to become more challenging as well. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook was going to move into the internet through the metaverse, which is really everything we're doing now times you know, a hundred. And so the idea of them living inside these digital realms, how do we equip our kids for that when they haven't even worked out what it's going to look like yet? Yeah, I want to get to self-regulating, self-monitoring in just a moment. But Ian, I want to talk to you now. Talk to us about what is happening physiologically when we're scrolling through Twitter, when we're looking at Facebook, when we can't put our devices down. What is that doing to our brains? Well, these are designed to catch your attention and then hold your attention and bring things to you that you relate to, that are meant for you. Perhaps importantly is what you're not doing at the same time. So I think what people worry about is the not attending to others, not being part of social conversations, not being engaged with others, not being focused on the face or voice or emotional impact of others while just attending to the screen. So the screens are designed to catch your attention, to hold your attention in a very unique way. And of course, now the screen moves with you it is different to the television age or previous technologies. It's everywhere, it's accessible. Every free moment is potentially attracting and then holding your attention. So that kind of issue of the focus on the now is very different to other cognitive processes that are thoughtful, that are imaginative, that are creative, where you actually have to generate the image, the idea, the emotion, and more importantly, I think, respond to the emotion of others other than what is coming to you through the screen. Ian, does it depend on how young a child is exposed to digital devices? Well, that, as Bryony said, is one of the big experiments. We don't know yet when you have this kind of exposure from very young ages, and we do have it from very young ages. Great examples of kids at very young ages, preschool, being able to work and manipulate the machines that we now have. So they will influence brain development, just as music does, just as sound does, just as reading does. So they'll have an effect. Whether that effect is a positive or a negative one, that is the big experiment. And I think this issue about attention, but more importantly, what we might call social cognition, the degree in which you engage with others, that's the impact that people are most worried about. Yeah, it is the social cognition. Bryony, I want to throw that question to you. You know, uh, Peter talked about how it is teenage girls that have been seen to have been very much uh, impacted by Instagram, by Facebook, but what's going online as well. Are you seeing that in your school and how, how are you dealing with it? I'm seeing it with teenagers broadly, uh, not just girls. I think that girls often get, personally, I think they often get a bad rap. Um, people are quick to label them as depressed and, and anxious. Um, I, I'm not uh, challenging the research that's come through if that's what they're seeing. What I am finding is how um, places where they are being taught to thoughtfully engage in what's in front of them, um, both socially and the technology and, and the devices that they're using, the students come out of that better 
than if they are effectively given the keys to the car and said and told, you know, you guys work it out for yourself. I think there is a certain level of adult naivety um, around the world that our young people are engaged in that if the adults were more cognizant of the risks that, that are happening in this world, they might be a little more thoughtful before they hand over these devices and pay for the Wi-Fi and pay for the social media and pay for the mobile data plan. Um, and so I find that disconnect the most disconcerting thing. So I look at young people and I go, yeah, sure, if you put any young child in an environment where there are absolutely no parameters, no guidelines, uh, no rules, and you say effectively fend for yourself, yeah, they're going to get hurt. Uh, the, dis the issue is not with them per se, but with the adults who allow these kind of environments to develop. To Bryony's point, um, one of the challenges I think to many parents is that the education system's really embraced a philosophy of bring your own device and it's coming younger and younger each year it appears. And then we end up giving our kids access to the greatest library on earth and the most toxic candy store in the one device and parents are being sort of left in the position where they've lost control of that introduction to technology. Particularly at that point of early high school, which I call digital puberty, when you are moving from the point of really moderating how a child's using their online space and then giving them a degree of autonomy. Now, all that is a sitting challenge, even if the technology was benign. But again, I would say, because you're constantly being pushed up against a business model, to Ian's point, which is designed to keep us all online longer, because that is the model of extracting our attention, it just creates huge problems. If there's any um, hope I take from recent times, it was through the lockdown, we actually saw for once the technology wasn't vendor driven, it was actually being driven to design a better educational experience. Critically, Zoom, its business model is not around surveillance capitalism, it's a fee for service. I think a lot of schools started using tools to enhance learning rather than trying to adapt the learning to the tools that existed. So if there's any hope, I think it's actually to move off the big corporate platforms and start a manage imagining technology um, to assist our kids through their journey, which includes both engaging with technology but also getting off technology. Ian, I do wonder, though, are we too cautious about this? You know, the more I talk to young kids who have been on devices, they seem really savvy. They seem to know what they're doing. Um, and it just seems to be that these devices are part of their DNA and sometimes they're far more savvy uh, on these devices and online than their parents are. So are we being overly cautious? Do these kids know how to self-regulate? Uh, no, for young kids, no. Kids don't self-regulate their diet, their exercise, their sleep. They go do pleasurable and enjoyable things. They respond to the environment. So to think that young kids are going to be self-regulating, I think the answer to that's no. But I think the too cautious... I think the issue is it is a large experiment. The social rules are developing long after the technology, as both Peter and Bryony have emphasised. So I think it is a period, and I think uh, the lockdowns and COVID has given us the opportunity to think differently. Where are the advantages for social connection? Where are the advantages for education? Certainly in healthcare and other areas, where are the advantages? But where also are the pitfalls? And in social and emotional development, there clearly are pitfalls in these areas. So I think the issue of parents and others, teachers, the wider society, who have also been massively impacted, going, hang on a second, how are we all impacted? And as a consequence, what sort of things do we prioritise? What kinds of other social interactions? What sort of moderation of exercise, sleep-wake cycles, other activities, and then use the advantages of these areas? So I think we are learning after the fact. It's out there, and now we're trying to work out how best, from a health and wellbeing point of view, might we make use of these technologies. Yeah. Just to say there is a lot of data about mental health problems in younger people, particularly mm. teenagers being in trouble. I don't think it's due to the technology. I think it's due to the impacts on lack of social connection. Peter, talk to us about the content. What are you hoping in terms of, you know, kids and screen times and particularly the consumption of the content online? Will that change? Look, I'd love to see norms put in place for healthy amounts of time on screen. I'd like to see clearer demarcations between education and the, the, the commercial leisure world that we've been talking about. And I'd like to see more um, priority given to 
the, the relationship between parents and teachers and the child to negotiate better spaces for our kids rather than just feeding them to the wolves. So, again, we've gone through this amazing journey over the last couple of years where we have broken what was there and we're now putting it back together. Let's not just revert back to where we were before the pandemic. And Bryony, I'm sure there are a lot of parents that may be watching this and throwing their hands in the air and go, well, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah, they shouldn't. Honestly, there's a lot of hope in this area. One of the things that a lot of schools did, and we were one of them, was that we ended up um, asking the students to reflect after they came back uh, after different lockdowns and about what they'd learnt. And overwhelmingly, they had learnt the value of friendships face to face versus being online. They were really thoughtful and reflective around the fact that actually having wanted screen time, being given all they wanted, they didn't want that much anymore. Um, and I think the other thing it's worth knowing is that some young people thrived. We've learned so much in schools around um, students who actually hated being in lockdown and, and going on technology and others for whom two or three days at home uh, using a device actually gave them breathing space that the hyper stimulation of a school environment um, was too overwhelming for them. So there, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us now to actually weigh up well, what did work and for whom and how can we capitalise on that so that we can help these young people grow up into strong, you know, independent adults. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights with us, Ian Hickey, Peter Lewis and uh, Bryony Scott. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I'm Audrey, I'm in grade five, I'm only 11 years old, and I'm Chris, I'm 50, and we live in Lake Boga in Victoria. I watch like anime on the Switch, I watch YouTube, play Minecraft and Animal Crossing, we dodge these rules, but um, you're not allowed on like technology apart from TVs on the weekend, weekdays, Week. you're allowed on them on Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday. My eldest daughter um, has high functioning autism. It's now enabled her to be access uh, more gaming, more drawing. But there's an unexpected flip side out of it is that um, she finds it difficult to socialise, um, but she's been able to communicate with um, her peers in a in a forum that she's safe with. So we've got this, you know, sort of situation where, yeah, like it's positive in one great aspect in one way we hadn't expected, but negative in another aspect which we hadn't considered or, yeah, expected. And thanks to all our parents and kids for being so honest about their use of digital devices. That's our show. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. Thank you for watching our special on Screen Time.